Welcome to this introduction to coding video on algorithms and why the instructions you give the computer matter. So when you're coding, you're giving computers instructions, but computers need very specific instructions in order to do things. You can't just give them vague instructions and hope they know what you mean. So what you need to do is break them down into their separate parts. And then you kind of build them back together a bit like building blocks into your actual code. But first of all, you need to be, make sure you're telling the computer every part of what they need to do. They can't assume and they could be errors or it could miss out things which are very important just because you haven't told it all the things it needs to know. Like if you're, you're learning something new, you can't assume computers know anything. Start from a base level and assume that all they know is the kind of commands you can give them. So you can't assume they can fill in any gaps. You need to give them things that you might think are obvious. You need to break down instructions into those parts. Breaking down tasks into the smallest possible parts helps you think like the computer and helps you work out what instructions you'd need to write and turn into computer code. If there's missing steps, as I said, it might cause errors um, or unexpected consequences because the computer has done something you didn't expect because you hadn't specified enough. So let's look at an example of this, because it can be quite difficult to think about uh, conceptually. How might you tell a computer to boil the kettle? So a computer's never boiled the kettle before. Maybe it's got a robot attached to it so it can actually boil a kettle for you. And you want to create some instructions that it would follow. Well, there's lots of different ways you could do it, actually, because there's always different ways you could tell instructions. But here's one example. So we're going to first of all say that we're starting the kettle thing. Telling the computer, we're going to, this, this, this is the kettle, and we're going to get going with this function, which is a way of saying a group of code, a set of instructions, a bit like a title. So the first thing we're going to do is tell the computer about the kettle, tell it to get the kettle, so it's got it there. That means it can use the kettle for whatever it's doing. Then we're going to get the computer to check if the kettle is already on. This might seem like something as a person you wouldn't need an instruction for. Nobody needs to know that when you're putting the kettle on, you need to make sure it's already on, not already on first. But a computer wouldn't think that, and otherwise it might be trying to put the kettle on when it's already boiling, for example, and that would be an issue and could cause accidents. Um, so we're going to get the computer first of all to check if it's already on. And if the kettle is already on, in the flowchart diagram that we're using here to look at, the instructions end. If it's yes, it just stops. No more instructions for the computer. If it's no, we continue with the rest of the instructions. So the next thing it would do is check the water level. Now, at this stage, you've got another decision where it needs to check if there's enough water. Now, these instructions probably could be improved because at the moment we haven't defined what enough water is and the computer would have no idea. But for our first draft around instructions, this will do. If there's not enough water, it can keep adding in increments of water. In this case, we've chosen five milliliters and adding more and more at a time, checking each time. You've got to keep the computer checking. You can't just assume it's going to do it until you want it to. You've got to really define the parameters it must use. Once there is enough water, the instructions can move on again, where it can now be connected to the mains electricity and switched on. Again, now the computer needs to check something. It needs to check if the kettle's finished boiling, basically. Is the water boiling? Again, we've given it some parameters. We said you wait 10 seconds and check again, and it will keep looking. These could be adjusted. So this is like a sort of first version of the instructions, but it might turn out that they need to actually check more often or less often. And then once it's yes, it kind of completes. So we can tell it, oh, you need to pour the water out um, to put it into the teapot. So this is one example. Now, as I've already pointed out, there's some things in here we could tweak. There's probably more specifications we can add and other places where the computer could go wrong. and We'd need to put in some more instructions to make sure it doesn't. So this is just one of the solutions, but you can start to see how we must break it down into tasks we perhaps wouldn't think of as humans. So breaking down the, what you want the computer to do into little parts is a really key part of coding, because that's how you are able to actually write the instructions as computer code. So the process we're going to use when we're writing code is going to follow these kind of steps. The first thing before we even think about typing any code is we're going to define what our code needs to do. We're going to define the goal of our project. The goal can change. You can create some, you can define a goal. You can perhaps start designing it. You can realize it needs to be tweaked. You can even code it and then think I need a new goal and improve it. But the first thing we need to do is know what we're doing. Know where the instructions are going to take us. The second stage, also before we start typing any code, is designing what it needs to do 
designing the instructions, basically. We need to work out what those stages are. We might do that using a flow chart, like the example I was using. We might do that using something called pseudocode, which is where you basically just write out in regular language, not a coding language, what the instructions might be, sort of in maybe on new lines or um, using arrows or something to help you. So it's something you can understand and you could turn into some code. There's other ways you might want to write it out. It depends what's useful. What's best is something that other people could understand as well. And then the third stage is to code each step of those instructions into a coding language that the computer will understand. And then your instructions can happen. So in this process, we meet algorithms because an algorithm is a precise set of instructions that describe an activity. So it's stage two, basically. It's that flow chart that we created. It's a set of instructions and decisions. Often algorithms contain decisions that will describe something that needs to happen, describe what needs to um, occur. Algorithms need to be precise. They need to be unambiguous, they need to be repeatable, and they can often be represented in different ways, as we've already discussed. The reason they need to be precise, as we seen, have seen, is because computers uh, need very specific instructions. They also need to be precise so that different people could potentially code them as well. So they need to be precise both to computers and to humans. They need to be repeatable, obviously, because there's no point in having an algorithm that can only run once. Um, you want an algorithm that can be used again and again. So you want instructions that are going to make sense logically. Once you've got those instructions, they can be written in computer code so the computer can follow them. So when people talk about algorithms, and they do that quite a lot these days, it comes up a lot uh, in different things, what they are talking about is the set of instructions and decisions that someone has designed for the computer to make. The computer is following those instructions. That's what it is. And it's really important to think about what those instructions are because they can have big consequences. Whether it means that your code just won't work because you've not given the computer enough instructions, to whether you've designed a set of decisions that build in biases that already exist or that don't work in all cases and are going to cause people to not be able to use the program if they want to enter the right information or use it in a particular way. So algorithms are really important. A program is then once you've got your algorithm and you've written that up into computer code. So you've taken what you've written in a way a human can understand it and you turned it into something the computer can also understand. You've made that algorithm something a computer can run. So let's have a little look at an example. If we've got and we want to make an app that plays a sound when a user presses a button. So it's pretty simple. It's not a very exciting example, but it's going to illustrate what we want to do. So we're going to start thinking about instructions and it's, we've got the app and it's going to need to get a button. It's going to need to get the sounds that need to be played. And then we've got to say when the user presses the button, play the sound once. So there's kind of a moment there of um, something happening, a sort of uh, something being triggered, an event occurring. When that happens, the sound is played. Now, there's more stuff we could put into these instructions to make sure the computer was exactly right. But this is our basic setup. You will notice I've tried to be a bit precise here. I've said play sound once because a computer, if you didn't write that, might just play the sound forever or until you at least pl pulled it out of the wall or turned it off. So being precise with things like that, like play sound once, can be quite important. So once we've defined the instructions, we can start turning this into something. So let's, let's do that. We will start by creating our app screen and our sound here and what we're using to create this um, using these screenshots is a tool called Thunkable which allows you to create apps using block-based coding so that's what we're going to be using here to make our app so we've made our button and our sound we've made sure that we've got the right a sound file attached to that sound so it's going to play the thing we expect and then we've written our code now Thunkable uses block-based coding so instead of having to type we have dragged and dropped our little pieces of code together and what we've got here sounds quite a lot like the instructions we wrote out in sort of human language, but it's a little bit different. So it says when button one click do in sound one call play, which is basically saying when button one is clicked play sound one, but just in a slightly different syntax um, because coding always uses slightly different um, wording for things. So we can see those instructions become actual code that can now happen. If we hadn't defined our code correctly, if we hadn't worked out what would need to happen in a logical order, then when we came to code it, we might not be able to find the right pieces to put together. It might not work. There could be issues. And then as you can, might be able to imagine, that becomes a broader problem the larger the algorithm gets and the more it needs to do. 
So when you've got something like Google's search algorithm, then it's quite important that the decisions the computer makes, the automated element of that, is finding the results that are actually useful to people and not bringing up stuff that isn't, because otherwise people, no one's going to use it. So algorithms are very important because what instructions the computer follows determines what the code does and ultimately how everything works. That was just a little introduction to thinking like a computer, giving it instructions and what algorithms are. If you'd like to know any more about coding, you can have a look at our coding practical guide. We've got a lot more information around what coding is, how you might choose what coding language to learn and some starting tips for getting going with them. You can find it at subjectguides.york.ac.uk forward slash coding. Thanks for listening. <laughs>